I'm very happy to be giving this talk about measuring POTS because I did this for my doctoral dissertation and I finished it a few years ago. And now after taking a much needed break from it, I'm coming back to this, this topic for publication. So this has been a wonderful chance for me to think through uh, what I've done and, and the possibilities of this method as I move more towards publication. And also as I use this methodology in more new research. So this is gonna cover several things that I've done. So for my dissertation, I measured modern pottery in Egypt to better understand issues of theory of metric analysis and research design problems. So I looked at pottery workshops in the Cairo area at Fustat. Um, I did an artist pottery uh, workshop at this place called Noor. I went to the very famous Nazla potters in the Fayum and then to a small village potter outside of Abydos. So I measured pots from these places and I'll be discussing this throughout, throughout this talk to give an understanding of issues with um, metric analysis, theory and methods and design. But the case studies are gonna come from, or the archeological pottery case studies are gonna come from Abydos. This was my doctoral dissertation, looking at uh, New Kingdom beer jars. So this is like 1500 to around 1000 BC and Middle Kingdoms around 2000 to 1500-ish BC, uh, uh, votive dishes, and all the way up to the late period, votive dishes from Abydos. And Abydos is, of course, a site that's connected to the cult of Osiris, the god connected to the underworld. So this was a place of incredibly Im um, important religious centers and cultic sites. And so I was looking at the production of pottery for, for the cult, um, both at a temple and at a very important festival site. And now I'm taking the lessons that I've, I've learned and the methodologies and I'm applying it to the new material for Wadi al Hudi. This is around 35 kilometers southeast of Aswan. And this is a Middle Kingdom uh, amethyst mining site. So I'm looking at the, the settlement of the miners that were, were mining amethyst for, for the administration for the crown. So for this one, I'm looking specifically at Zeers. I'm looking at uh, big, big moral uh, water jars. So this is sort of what I'll be talking about throughout this, this lecture. So of course, when we think about understanding socioeconomic issues connected to pottery production, immediately we think about, um, you know, all the stuff that we learn in our, in our ceramic analysis classes and our, our anthropology classes of craft specialization, standardization, scale of production, all these things. And ideally, we want to find direct evidence of craft production to address a whole host of socioeconomic issues. And this is the Nazla Potter Workshop in the, in the Fayum, and everybody would love to find this equivalent on an excavation to help us understand so many of our questions about the socioeconomic um, organization of pottery production. But unfortunately, that's just not the case. Most of... of, of um, there are very few pottery production sites that have been excavated. And certainly within Egypt, there are very few pottery production sites. Uh, so we need to turn to um, indirect evidence of social and economic aspects of, of pottery production. And this is where metric analysis fits in. So it's, it's, it's less obvious to interpret metric analysis than something like excavating a workshop, which already there's a lot of methodological and interpretive issues when you excavate a workshop. But when you're measuring pottery to understand something that's connected to economics or, or social issues about potting, there becomes a lot more complications in terms of the research design and, and, and method and how we interpret this. So in general, the research design is as follows. You would select a pottery type, which as we'll see, selecting a pottery type is much easier said than, than done. Then you measure a variable from a single pottery type within an, an assemblage. So this is a modern bowl from the Fustat potters in Cairo. And this shows you all the points that I measured uh, when I worked with the modern potters um, from different points of wall thickness to rim diameter, height, lip thickness, width, all these kind of things. Um, and then there's some sort of descriptive statistic that's used to calculate the sort of variability within the sample. Um, and people have started to, people have been using metric analysis pretty much regularly since the 1960s to understand different, you know, economic and social things about 
pottery production. And at first, when people started using this method, they used just the standard deviation uh, in order to do a comparison, but the standard deviation doesn't really work very well for this because the standard deviation depends on the size of the thing you measure. It's related to the, to the mean. So there needs to be a, a relationship between the mean and the standard deviation to compare. So there's been a huge change in the statistics that people have used from the 60s when they started doing this to the 80s when they kind of figured out a good descriptive statistic. And then people need to calculate some sort of confidence intervals or do some kind of significance testing to help interpret these results. Um, and there's a big issue with this, and we'll we'll talk about it later on and 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 hopefully get a better understanding of what to do. And then, of course, you interpret the results. And this is also an incredibly challenging but also very exciting part of metric analysis research. So the coefficient of variation is is what, what people started using since the 1980s, there's a whole host of ethnographic papers um, and papers on archaeological ceramics using the coefficient of variation as the descriptive statistics to describe this amount of variance with, within a sample. And people like it. I mean, this is this is one of the one of the things that everyone kind of uniformly agrees on that this is good, this is working. Um, because it takes into account the mean and its relationship to the standard deviation. So we can compare pots of different sizes. Uh, so the coefficient of variation is the standard deviation divided by the mean of the sample times 100. And we times it by 100 to form a percent. And I think the reason is because um, it's just more intuitive and easier for people to use a percent than just a random, like just like a number. So a high CV indicates a variable sample and a low CV indicates a homogenous sample. So a pottery sample with a CV of five is more homogenous than a pottery sample with a CV of 7%, for, for example. So that's important to keep in mind as we, as we move forward. So the theory behind metric analysis has been sort of changing and in flux with larger trends in, in um, archaeological theory. When people started to use this, this method in, in the, the 60s, it was this idea that, that standardized potters make standardized pots. So up into the 60s and 80s and even you know, into the 90s and early 2000s, people were trying to use metric analysis to determine if a pottery assemblage was made by um, specialist potters or non-specialist potters. So this was a, a big research question. And some, some argued that 10% coefficient of variation was a dividing line between a standardized versus a non-standardized assemblage with specialized versus non-specialized potters. And then it's you know also viewed as an indicator of the intensity and scale of production. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this uh, Kathy Costin paper from 1991, the seminal paper about the socioeconomic organization of craft production, where she put these four parameters of, of production so scale would be size and the constitution of production uh, units. So like small kin based production to factory and concentration and intensity would be the time dedicated to crafting. So part-time to full-time. So again, connecting to that specialized potters or non-specialized potters. So this was a bit of a thing in the eighties to the early 2000s to do ethnographic research and uh, to come up with dividing line or parameters of certain numerical values of the coefficient of variation, the CV, that links with very specific scale and intensity of production. So this is one by Valentina Rue, which I like this paper. I think it's a, it's a very interesting paper. And it's one of the papers that kind of inspired my, my, my dissertation, where she looked at, at potters from, from India and from Spain, and sort of at the end concluded that if it's less than 3% coefficient of variation, it's a large scale production. If it's between three and six, it's you know large or small, but somewhere between four and fourteen thousand pots. And if it's over six, it's a really small scale production. And this has been wonderful food for thought, and I appreciate it. But as I started doing my research and thinking more, it's it's pretty clear that there's lots of challenges with um, connecting a number of coefficient of variation with a specific type of um, a volume of production, a scale or intensity of production, particularly with archeological ceramics. So these are interesting ideas that give us a sense of things, but 
I would caution anyone to, to, to really apply this directly to an archeological sample. So as I move for, forward, and a lot of papers have been coming out, it seems that metric variability obviously is incredibly complicated. And so we need to ask ourselves, what does metric analysis actually measure? And there's no actual straightforward answer to this question. That's because there's just like so many factors that affect metric variability. These are things from the organization of production like scale and intensity, control over potting, the economics of pottery production, like the demand, the mechanisms of distribution, the relationship between the producers and consumers, distributors, the technology, Forming technology, as we'll see, is less impactful, but certainly using measurements uh, to aid in the production of pottery using a measurement device would uh, impact metric variability. And we have social aspects of technology like skill, practice, and learning, um, workshops where you have apprentices and different skill levels. There's been ethnographic papers that have focused on that and shown how it in increases metric variability. And this is a really important one that I think we need to think about a lot in archaeological ceramics is the value of uniform pottery. And as I'll show you, if people want uniform pots, potters can very easily make uniform pottery. This is not a particularly challenging thing for them, particularly if they have if they have skill. So if there's some need for the pottery to be uniform, that's that's a very important one. This also relates to vessel function. I mean, vessel use. Uh, is directly relates to its, its variability and also the need for an intentional uniformity. This is particularly important for bowls or jars that could be used as measurements of, of some kind of solid good or liquid commodity. There might be a lot of good reason to make a pot that is very homogenous. And then we have issues, of course, over here with that deal with research design and, and aspects of research, particularly for archaeological ceramics. The archaeological context brings a whole host of variability to, to pottery. And that's because archeological contexts are deposited over large periods of time. And for the pots, there's many production episodes that produce them. And there's a lot of issues going on with the use and discard of pottery within an archeological site that can impact metric variability. And of course, this is one of the more challenging ones and I'm in the midst of this right now as I'm, I'm moving forward with the Wadi El Hudi uh, Marl C. Ziers with the pottery, the ceramicist pottery typology, because we're creating samples and everything we do is based on our samples. And that depends on how we create pottery typologies and understanding pottery types and how we view the type. So these, all of these mean that metric analysis can actually measure a bunch of things from this big broad list. So we need to understand if we're measuring issues related to our research design, if we're measuring issues related to pots that are needing to be uniform and in terms of are there some kind of value to having a uniform pot or if we're measuring issues if we're measuring pots that are just coming from a bunch of different workshops instead of just one workshop I mean there's a lot of a lot of issues we need to take into account in our interpretation of metric analysis so this is very brief <laughs> but I'll run through this so to test a lot of these different factors that affect metric variability I took 20 samples from potters in Egypt. So Fustat, I went, and this is the Fustat pottery, and I found these little bowls down here, and I just took 20 from the stack of bowls that were being sold in front of the workshop. And, and I talked to the potters, and we had our discussion, and then I asked them to try to make, I wanted 20 bowls, and I said, I'd like them of the same size, please. Can you please make them the same size? So Fustat sample one is the 20 that I bought out here. Sample two is the intentionally uniform ones. Then I went to an art potter who makes a bunch of beautiful pots for the upscale, like kind of fancy uh, cup and plates and, and nice home accessory stores in Cairo. And for, for him, it was very important to have uniform pots because that's what people wanted. So I measured the little saucers here, the dishes that go with the Turkish coffee cups. And I measured a big jar uh, in the Marusa pottery near, near Abydos. And the Nazla pots, I measured a big a big bowl. These are the pots in the Fayum. So anyways, we can see that there's lots of different, that they have very low rim diameter coefficient of variations. Their CVs are very low, which means they're incredibly uniform. But we see a lot of difference in the potters uh, between um, whether they're trying to make intentionally standardized pottery like Noor and Fustat. So the ones that try to make standardized pots are the most homogenous, 
uh, comparatively, none of them are using measurement aids. We have different amounts of people in the workshop. Um, several of them are pooled production events that it, the pots are from a lot of different production events over the last several months. Um, and per potter, though, there's overall a pretty high, high output per potter. So to kind of summarize what I found with this, and I'll explain what these mean later, but these are the, the, the confidence intervals of the sample. So this is the, the little line in the center is the actual CV. And then this is the possible ranges of CV that could be if you repeated the experiment uh, over and over again. So I found that there's a, a strong uh, connection between highly uniform pots and people who make a lot of pots. So if potters are making a lot of pots, their skill is increasing and they're making uniform pots. Uh, and this is in line with tons of other ethnographic research that supports this. Um, also, there's a few ethnographic research uh, that, that agrees with this statement here that if pot potters are trying to make uniform pots, they will make very uniform pots. And this is regardless of whatever technology. The Nuzla potters are using paddle and anvil and everyone else is using a slow wheel. So, or sorry, a kick wheel. Um, so whatever the technology, the technology doesn't seem to have that much of an impact. It's more the intention of making that uniform pots. And of course, like many have said before, pooled production increases metric variability. So this is different production events and different potters. Um, and in terms of, rim, of measurements, this there's a, a, some research that goes along with this too, that rim diameter is the most sensitive to metric analysis. And we'll see this in the next slide. So it's 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 ideal for for as a variable to measure in metric analysis studies. And this is another important issue is sample size. And this one needs to be researched a bit more with ethnographic work. What do we need in terms of sample size to trust our metric analysis results? Uh, and so small sample sizes, 20 had very consistent results with, with rim diameter and the confidence intervals, you can see here, the spread is between 2.5 and five, between one and, and 2.5. So when we have that very short spread of confidence intervals, it means that if you kept repeating this over and over again, that, that it's, it's, it, it means that basically the, the spread is very small because it's probably accurately reflecting the, the parent population that they came from. So this gives me a lot of trust that, that 20 is a good sample size for, for this material. I can comfortably make statements about it. So the choice of variable to measure. So basically rim and the base were the most consistent. Height was less reliable. It seems that potters, and this is other ethnographic studies can, are in line with this, is that when potters are throwing pots or forming pots, they seem to put more attention to rim than height. And there's a lot of things that can affect vessel height. And particularly if there's rounded bases, you can see it's a bit wonky here, the base. So if you measure it, you know, th this might be a little more indented at the bottom. Others might be a little more out. So it can make differences, but height for many, many interesting reasons, and this needs to be explored more, is less reliable for coefficient of variation measurements. Wall thickness is not ideal at all. Um, small measurements don't work well with the coefficient of variation. So particularly things that are a centimeter or less, um, the nature of the statistic, and it's a bit complicated, but essentially it, it can just throw everything off. So wall thickness, usually walls are too thin to measure with uh, metric analysis. And then, you know, so the same kind of lip thickness doesn't work as well. And also if things are thrown on a wheel, if you pick a point, say five centimeters down on the rim and you measure it, it might be at the peak of, of a reeling mark or it might be at the valley of a reeling mark from a fast wheel. So it's 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 less reliable. Um, so in terms of research design issues, our, our big ones are archeological context and the biggest, biggest one is creating your samples. So there's been a considerable amount of work on this issue of cumulative blurring, as people call it, in the archaeological context, which is the pots coming from a long period of time and many, many, many different workshops. So Black Van Stein and Van Diver did this really interesting study at Tele Lan Syria with, I think, third millennium uh, BC bowls, these Tele Lan bowls, and they found a waster stack that was fused uh, in, in a workshop. And they did a coefficient of variation measurement of different parts of this waster stack. 
And then they measured the same bowl type from various archaeological contexts and found that in the archaeological context, it was double, then the CV values were double compared to the waster stack. So this is what they call cumulative blurring, this increase in metric variability. So for us, when we're dealing with, with creating a metric analysis project with archaeological ceramics, we need to think how we can address this. So archaeological context is important. Um, so it is ideal to take pottery from very specific archaeological context where you can connect the pots and kind of have a sense of how the pots were used and discarded in that space to help you understand some of the issues with time. Um, but that also comes, is, is, is directly related to how we understand the pottery type and the chronology of, of these pots. So certainly selecting archaeological context where there's an understanding of where the, you know, how the pots were used and discarded, I think would be very helpful in addressing issues of, of, of this cumulative blurring in the archaeological context. There's no way to really get rid of cumulative blurring unless, of course, you have the amazing luck of finding something like this Telelan waster stack. If you're using pots that are from the excavation, they're going to be biased by this cumulative blurring. So it's important when you're measuring different samples to try to find samples that are biased in the similar way. Because if they're all biased in the same way, then really what you're comparing is the metric variability with samples that all have the same bias, so you can, can at least compare amongst them. Now, it would be hard to compare the archeological samples to ethnographic pottery, but at least sample A, B, and C can be compared with each other, which is certainly something that, that's, that's still very helpful. So our next problem is figuring out the type of pot you want to measure. So, Basically, this is how we how do we define pottery types in archaeology, which is like an infinitely complicated and, and, and challenging issue in ceramic analysis. Uh, so obviously you keep the shape or the form, the fabric, the technology, the function should kind of be aligned. Uh, there should be an understanding of the chronological use of, of the, the pottery and how the pottery changes over time, the, pot, the chronological changes. Um, and a huge, huge, huge issue with this is creating sub variations within the pottery type, uh, whether it's splitting versus lumping, you know, how, how are we over splitting? Are these actually, you know, the same pottery type and we're making our sample more homogenous or are we making our sample more heterogeneous by lumping a bunch of stuff together? And size groups becomes a major problem. You know, are there different size classifications of the pots? So what I have found helpful in my research is, measuring pots that are distinct in terms of their function and use at an archeological site. So these are from the Abido samples from the um, the, te the temple and the festival at um Umogab in Abidos. There's these little tiny votive cups that have a very specialized function. So it's helpful understanding their type. And these are beer jars that also in the, um, in the festival context or the temple context have a very specific function. And likewise at Wadi El Hudi, these uh, Marl C zeers are these huge, I mean, we call them zeers because they look so much like the, the zeers, the modern Egyptian water, uh, water jars, storage jars. So these are huge storage jars for, for water and their fabric is very different than everything else. Their shape is very different than everything else. So they're all unique pottery types that, that stand out. I, I would be curious to work on this uh, type of methodology for more like a direct, simple, plain rim bowl or something like that, and how it would compare with a very specialized pottery type and in terms of metric analysis. But that's what I've gone for in the research because it's a bit easier to account for. So another issue here is sherds versus whole pots. So these are the New Kingdom samples where I looked at the beer jars from Umal Gob that were whole pots versus the rim sherds uh, from the North Abydos votive zone temple. So this is from the festival and this is from the temple. Um, so basically you can use sherds or whole pots depending on the situation. So again, one needs to lead with the archeological context and understanding of the pots and the study can work well with both. You just need to think through the advantages and the considerations of both. One advantage of whole pots is that we can be more comfortable with 
delineating types because we have the whole pot. You know, we we can see how the pot changes over time. Like a lot of the chronological differences in pottery might be with the, the size or the base of the pot or something like that. So you get a better sense of the pottery type. Um, also, when it comes to whole pots, uh, we can get really precise measurements, which you, you know, if you just have a rim shirt, it's a bit more, it's, it's different. Um, but with whole pots, sometimes uh, this comes at a difficulty with the archaeological context where for many, many research studies, they might not have whole pots. So in such cases, if you know the pottery types very well, then you can use rim shirts uh, and it could, it could work. Uh, as well, which is, I think, important. So this is this is the kind of uh, situation that I'm in right now. So once you take your measurements of the pots, right, you you need to to, to get a sense of the the spread of of the the measurements of your variables. So we're using rim diameter here. So these are histograms from Abydos. These ones in gray, and this one in blue is a um, is a Maro Cizir sample from Wadi El Houdin. So as you can see. The Abydos ones are all like it's from nine to 14 centimeters for these uh, rim rim diameter types. And there's, you know, one or there's two, two, three, four, five samples. It's kind of relatively evenly clustered. There's a spike at 10 and there's a spike at 12, uh, but it seems that it's between nine and 13. Likewise, this Umagab between five and seven, this is incredibly, these, those are eh, these little guys, uh, these little cups. They're incredibly homogenous and they're between, you know, two centimeter rim diameter. But then we get to something here, which we're going to end the talk with this. When I'm looking at these Marl C0 rim diameters, this is 20 centimeters down here. Then we have our next one at 23. So we have a two centimeter not accounted for. Then 23 to 26, we've got more samples. And then we just have one sample again from 27, 28, 29, 30. So there's these gaps. So does one remove this from the sample because it's an outlier maybe, and maybe this would have been a different size classification because again, I'm dealing with the zeers, I'm dealing with just the rim shirts. So with this 20 centimeter, can we put it in the same group as the 30 centimeter rim diameter or are they different size groups? Or is this kind of widespread of rim diameter the exact variability that I'm trying to measure? And if I remove some of these, and kind of trim the sample, am I altering this so that I'm just measuring my research design and I'm not really measuring um, information about the ancient you know, socioeconomic organization of pottery production? And this is something to consider. So when you move forward with research design, I highly recommend thinking about this in terms of samples because th this is statistical research at the end of the day. And before I get into this, I wanna preface this with, I am not a statistician. I delved into statistics with the dissertation. And as you'll see in the next slide, I worked with uh, people at the University of Toronto Statistics Consulting Program where I did my, my, my PhD to better understand what I'm doing and figure this out. So, so this has been kind of a eye-opening experience for me in the last you know many years of doing this with my, my dissertation. Well, I think about this differently. So I think now in terms of samples, I used to think about this in terms of pottery assemblages and now I've kind of re reworked this so I think of it in terms of samples. So I'm measuring samples and these samples reflect a parent population. So I need to articulate what the sample is and I need to articulate what the parent population is and the relationship between them. And this is also very important when you're, it helps me become more aware of the archeological context and the pot that I'm looking at as I work through this thought exercise and creating my samples. Um, and this should help you avoid cherry picking uh, pottery from all over the sites to get the pots that you wanna measure. So once you have the samples and you have the measurements and you calculate the coefficient of variation, uh, which, which I just do in Microsoft Excel, uh, we need to think about the, the coefficient of variation is a descriptive statistic, which is great, but alone it's not enough. It needs some kind of confidence intervals or significance testing. And this is done so that we can understand if the coefficient of variation that we measured is the result of the vagaries of sampling or if it actually might relate to some real phenomena. So how do we do this? And this is a major, major challenge. There's not that many papers that get into this issue. I mean, 
So a lot of coefficient of variation papers or metric analysis papers that use coefficient of variation, they have a range of methodologies with the statistics. Some don't do any significance testing or confidence intervals, which I completely understand why they wouldn't, because there is not a clear way of doing significance testing or confidence intervals with the coefficient of variation. Um, and that's been a consistent problem. So some people just kind of don't do it, which I get. Um, then there's a whole bunch of different methods that have been used, uh, but most of them are using significance testing or confidence intervals based on things like the standard deviation. So what people wanted to do was to do significance testing with the actual coefficient of variation itself. And there's one paper that put together a really interesting idea, but it's very hard to do. And I felt very stuck with this. So I booked an appointment with the University of Toronto Statistics Consulting Program and Yi Lu, who was a master's student who was sort of assigned to my case, um, did a fantastic job of, of, of supporting me with this and coming up with this, this thing to do. So what I've been using is a non-parametric, non-central t-distribution test, and I calculate confidence intervals, 95% uh, confidence intervals, using a statistical program R. Now this, I'm not gonna get into all this because it's really complicated. Um, but it's actually not that complicated. I mean, it, it, it just requires some explanation, but I can explain how to do this using R. It's, it's shockingly simple to do this using the statistical program R. I am not the most computer competent person in the world and, and I'm able to do this. I have screenshots of every step of how to do this. And it's not something that I would, you know, probably publish in an academic paper, but please contact me if you want this kind of information. I can walk you through it step by step of how to do this. And I'm very happy to support anyone in this, in this process if you're thinking about doing it. So please contact me for the step-to-step -step guide. So basically, how you, you look at these, these um, confidence intervals. So this is the spread of possible uh, coefficient of variations that would have come from this North Abydos votive zone whole mouth beer jar. So it could have been anything from nine to 19, but the actual CV here is around 12. And then we can see we have down here this New Kingdom votive dish that its CV is something a little bit over 5.5 and its spread is somewhere between, you know, seven and uh, at the top and, and four or something at the bottom. Now, most of the samples, their confidence intervals overlap. And if this confidence intervals overlap, then there is no significant difference between the sample CVs that, that, that there could have been many reasons and many, many reasons why uh, these samples have this range of, of CV. And so we do see that there's a difference in the beer jars between the Umalgab samples and the North Abydos votive zone samples, but there's no statistical significance between these, these samples. However, when we come to the New Kingdom votive dish, there's no significant difference between the Umalgab beer jar and the New Kingdom votive dish, but there is a difference between the votive zone uh, beer jars from the New Kingdom and the New Kingdom votive dishes at Umalgab. So basically, if the confidence intervals overlap, there's no statistical significance of the differences. But if they don't overlap, if there's a, a space here, then there is a significant difference. And it means that most probably the, co the coefficient of variation that's been measured is actually reflecting a real phenomena and is not you know, part of the, the random vagaries of sampling. You know, It could be something real. So that was a very important and very helpful tool that let me think through how I interpret these, these samples that I measure in archeological context and from the modern pottery as well. So this is a wonderful method and I'm, I'm giving this talk as part of my effort to publish uh, the modern pottery and this statistical methodology together in a paper so other people can use this for, for their confidence intervals and significance testing. So the last sort of issue with, with the, the statistics to think about is sample size. And this is really um, a difficult one for many people. So most statistics textbooks say, you know, you should probably have a sample size of, of 30 elements or 30 pots that you would measure. But that can be very hard uh, in archaeology and, and hard with metric analysis, particularly if you're taking into account archaeological context and pottery type to find 30 or more that makes sense is, is, is a bit challenging. 
So the metric analysis used 20 and that seemed to go well. And my archeological samples often have less than 20. So with this, here's what I advise. It's possible to calculate how a small sample size reflects a larger population using confidence intervals. But it's very hard to counteract the effect, the numerous research design factors that could affect metric variability. So base your samples on the pots in the archeological context, and then take a look at the confidence intervals and try to understand the sample and, and how you can interpret them. That's my sort of perspective on this. So it's also important to compare samples and it's 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 a good idea um, because having just one CV value floating around, it doesn't really say much. You need to compare different samples of different pots to understand what's going on. So the idea like you're doing here is I can say, New Kingdom beer jars from North Abydos are more variable than New Kingdom votive dishes from the festival site of Umagal. I, you know, so I'm comparing two sample populations to make further comments about the socioeconomic organization of production, but we need to do this by, by comparison. So it's important not to just do one sample and that's it. So my summary for this whole research section, here's what I would do my research design as I move forward. You start with the pottery in the archeological context. So you build your question around the best data set you have rather than starting with a question and then hunting around for pots to fit the question, which is, you know, this depends on the luck you have with the archeology, span your, your finds, your pots, it just completely depends. Then collect the sherds from the specific archeological context or whole pots if, apl if applicable. And then you group them with, you know, the fabric, the, the technology, the function, the size, and then group them into your samples and then define the populations that the samples represent. Then you measure as many variables as you can record from this material. And I use Excel to input the measurements, but you definitely need rim diameter. I mean, that's, that's one that's like non-negotiable. You need rim diameter. And then, you know, why not? There's no harm in measuring other rim, uh, other variables. Then create histograms or some other data visualization to understand the spread of the elements in the sample. And then ask yourself, should I further subdivide this sample into different size groups? Now, if you subdivide into different size groups, it's important to provide the data from the original group and the subdivided group to have a broader discussion. Because again, you might be making a homogenous sample that may have very little to do with the actual real um, or, or the, the original pottery type as, as anyone would have seen it in the ancient world. So it's important to have both. Um, calculate the coefficient of, of variation on all samples and subdivided samples. And then you calculate the confidence intervals using, um, I, I would suggest using, using R and using this kind of method that I use. And then you look at the confidence intervals and you evaluate if you think you have enough pots in the sample to make further claims. Now, as we'll see with the Abydos case, there were some that I didn't, you know, I only had three or four samples and the confidence interval spreads for the coefficient of variation would range from like 5% to 30%. And I'm like, well, this is not helpful because it just shows that there's way too few pots in the sample to reflect the, the actual parent population. So I'll jump into my, um, my Abydos. I'm gonna try to wrap this part up in 15 minutes so I can leave time for questions. Uh, so the Abydos case study. So I looked at pottery from North Abydos and from the German Institute's uh, Umar Gob project. So this is where the small temple is at North Abydos. It's of a small chapel of Tutmos III. And Umar Gob was the site of a huge festival for Osiris. And this was a processional route that would come here for this big festival. So I'm very, very grateful for Julia Budka and Ute and Andreas Eflin for, for letting me measure the pots for from their their material because I I wouldn't have been able to do do my dissertation without it it's fantastic um so my guiding research questions were about the socioeconomic organization of pottery production for temple and festival cult in Abydos was there a difference between the small temple and the festival in terms of the socioeconomic organization of production that supplied pots for these two type of cultic spaces 
And then what's the broader implication for understanding the socioeconomic organization of craft production in ancient Egypt based on what we're finding? So these are the samples. Um, so I looked at, uh, this is type two and this is the whole mouth beer jars. And I had sample sizes of 17 and 14. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see, there's a wide chronological use of these of these beer jars, which could definitely increase the metric variability, uh, the, the variability of the pottery. But overall, in the assemblage, um, when I looked at beer jars from, from the, the temple as a whole, there was a wide variety of fabric from different, different fabric types. There was a lot of variability in the forming technology of the bases and in the overall assemblage. So, so the beer jars look to be highly variable just on the sort of regular metrics or regular uh, things that we look at under pottery analysis. The Umalgab beer jar samples, uh, there was a type two sample that was 19, included 19 pots, and they were from two different uh, piles of, 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 of beer jars and piles of pottery. And the archaeological context at Umagab is very complicated. It seems that the priest would go and clean up the offerings and move them. So the archaeological context could add a lot of, of variability here. Um, I grouped several of Yulia Budka's types together. Um, she had this great typology. But if we look at the Abydos material, the North Abydos material, I couldn't get this sort of refined typology that Yulia Budka did for some of these because, um, because I just had the small rim shirt. So I, I grouped several of them together and that kind of mirrored some of the variability that I was measuring in, in, uh, in North Abydos. But overall, the pots that I looked at, they were incredibly homogenous. They were an ILB2. They had a very similar manufacturing technology. Um, and they also have a broad 19th to 20th dynasty date range. Now, the votive dishes here, the Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom, and then I had these New Kingdom incense burner. There were only seven in that sample. But the votive dishes have 24 in the sample. Uh, and the, the Middle Kingdom dishes had 20. Um, and the Middle Kingdom dishes were incredibly variable with fabric and forming technique. But once we start getting to the New Kingdom bowl and the incense burner, the general assemblage of these kinds that I looked at were very homogenous. Um, and we can see the same thing with a third intermediate period dish and this gobby, this late period of votive um, pot. Um, and it was incredibly homogenous in terms of fabric and forming technique and was very abundant at the site. Um, so my my design here for this research was I grouped like beer jars at the North Abydos votive zone in terms of vessel form, fabric technology, and archaeological context. And I only use the archaeological, like the North Abydos area is, is a very complicated archaeological situation. There's been many, many excavations over time. And there's just a very few sort of floor levels that, that were sort of in situ context. So I used those from a couple excavation squares. And then from Omagab, this was an archaeological context where, again, the pots were churned over many times and put into these piles. So they're both biased in terms of the archaeological context in sort of a similar way that would increase metric variability. So I felt comfortable comparing the samples. So I measured the pots. Uh, I used a rim diameter chart for the North Abydos votive zone material and digital calipers for Omagab because um, they were whole pots. And of course, this is this is an area where it could increase some metric variability using a rim diameter versus a digital caliper. I created histograms, reevaluated the sample groups, and articulated the samples and their populations, calculated the CV, calculated the confidence intervals. And then I did a lot of research for the interpretation. So I considered the inheritance biases in the samples, the different fabric and forming variability from the assemblages as a whole. And I looked at culturally specific understanding of socioeconomic organization of pottery production in the New Kingdom, where I looked at a lot of production sites. And I looked at the text that we have about pottery production, which is very few. Um, and basically, there are incredibly few. Uh, so, so what we know of is that from the New Kingdom, from what we can see, there tends to be 
smaller workshops, you know, where you would have like one, two, three kilns that are maybe, you know, less than two, two meters in diameter clustered throughout different areas. And it doesn't seem to be this massive factory style that we see so far uh, in the archaeological record. So then I made a, a whole list of research questions specifically asking about the variability between very specific samples. And I answered all those questions. And then anyway, the result comes out to this, where, as I showed you earlier, we have these confidence intervals where there is generally the Umalgab beer jar is around eight, nine percent CV, and it's around 11, 12 percent for the North Abydos votive zone, but there's no statistical difference between these. And then we get our New Kingdom votive dish and we get our late period cup that there is a statistical significance between these and the New Kingdom beer jars from North Abydos. So I started thinking, and my conclusion is that the beer jars from the temple in the North Abydos votive zone were probably procured from many different workshops. So what we're actually looking at here and what I'm measuring with the variability, given the overall variability in the, the pots in general, the beer jars in general, is that a bunch of different potters probably supplied this temple, that they didn't have a massive workshop that was producing just for them. Whereas with Umal Gab, maybe they had a more limited number of workshops producing their beer jars because again, it's more homogenous in terms of fabric and forming technique. So maybe there was one sort of workshop or very few number of workshops that were supplying the beer jars for the festival. This could be one workshop supplying for the beer jar for the festival, then maybe people were coming and bringing in some beer jars from the outside. It's not clear. The New Kingdom and the late period votive pottery, they were highly homogenous. And this tells me that they were produced from very few workshops and perhaps maybe even one large workshop. And this points to a different type of production, perhaps, than what we see with the New Kingdom beer jars in the North Abydos Temple. So these votive dish variability, it might be connected to the changes in the quantity of pottery over time and the demand that in peak, um, peak festival activity, we see a lot more votive dishes and a lot a lot more votive dishes from the New Kingdom and from the late period. And maybe what we're measuring here, it seems that it's an intensif intensification of production to, to meet this very, an intensification of production to meet this very high demand for votive pottery um, in Abydos for this, this very large Abydos festival at Omar Gob. And it could indicate that there are these large workshops that we're producing for the festival, um, which is very different than what's happening on the small temple that's probably getting pots from everywhere else. So if you notice my interpretation here wasn't, it's this type of high output workshop versus this type of low output workshop or it's standardized, not standardized. It's trying to understand the relationship between the sample the demand for this, the pots and the possibility of both the, the way pots were procured at the site and the, the type of workshops that produce them. So it's, it's, it's taking into account more factors that would affect metric variability is what I am trying to do. So now we move on to our Marl C Zers. And this is one that I've just started working on now. And this is Marl C. It's a very distinct pottery fabric um, than the usual uh, Nile silt assemblages. And these are large, large storage jars, probably for water that had these flat bases. Um, and they're found at Wadi El Hudi. So Wadi El Hudi is around 35 kilometers southeast of Aswan. The Wadi El Hudi expeditions excavated, uh, directed by Kate Liska, Brian Kramer, and myself. And we found a lot of sites so far, more than 51. Um, and site five is right here in this cluster. And Wadi El Hudi was a site of amethyst mining. And you can see this is a beautiful piece of amethyst that we found during our excavation from amethyst processing. And this area is the, the, the desert. There, so far, we don't know where the water came from, uh, but there was very limited water on the site. So water storage would have been a, a central significant issue. And so the pottery that stored water were very important. And importantly, there is no local pottery production. All the pots were brought in from outside to the site to supply the miners and the mining activities. 
So our research question for these Marl C Zers is, I want to know about the supply of Marl C Zers and the, possibly the goods they carried to Wadi al Hudi. And this directly relates to issues of organizing mining expeditions. I want to know how variable uh, the assemblage was and if there's any differences between the types of Zers and any changes over time. So I'm asking, is this some sort of large centralized production where there's, you know, like the Marl C Zero factory that is sending out to the mining expedition or is the state getting pots from lots of different workshops all over the country or different areas and they're pulling from pots from many different workshops and then supplying the miners with this sort of dispersed network of, of producers. So I looked at site five and uh, what I'm talking about has been recently published in an article in um, the Daily Life in Ancient Egyptian Settlements edited by Johanna Siegel. If you guys wanna check that out to get more information, but this is site five, it's made out of dry stone. <clears throat> this is the mine here. This sort of a low enclosure around the mine. And this is a circular settlement built on top of a hill. Uh, we have this area called the UC, the upper court. And then these are like settlement areas. So these are settlement areas around here where the little houses are. And this is a huge courtyard. There was an open space and it was highly protected. The only way up is through this one gate and you have to go through this kind of steep area. And then you're in this courtyard. And this area had a bunch of zeers and there weren't many zeers in the settlement area below. And I discussed this in this article and present the, the numbers about this. And then there's this area over here that we call the zeer dump where people will probably threw the trash of the zeers from the upper court into this, this zeer dump area. Now, in terms of my, my methods, I collected from these operations uh, up here in the upper court. I collect all the pots and they're in the Aswan magazine and I analyzed all the zeers, the fabric, the, I drew them, I did the full you know, analysis that one does with, with ceramics. And I wanted to kind of incorporate the zeer dump zeers into this. And so I did a zeer survey where we made these different zones and I went through with uh, a paper and I, I went to the zero dump and I recorded rim diameter, rim thickness, wall thickness, one centimeter under the rim, the fabric, the form type, form type, according to the Wadi El Hudi zero typology, but I didn't bring the sherds back to Aswan for further analysis. So I recorded this and I entered it into Excel and I created sample groups based on the zero form and type and fabric, and then did the histograms. And I am now in the process of reevaluating the samples but I've already calculated the CV and the confidence intervals to help me understand this, this histogram. And I'm at the moment now where I am considering what to do with these samples because there's a bit of, 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 of complexity. So there's two types that I, I looked at here. There's type one, this is a more rounded rim zier. This is earlier in the Middle Kingdom. It's late 11th through early 12th dynasty. The settlement started in the late 11th dynasty. Uh, and then there's the type two zier which is kind of flattened here at the top and smushed with a tool. And that's a bit of a later development within the 12th dynasty. So this is earlier, this is later. I measured 62 um, zeers rims and the majority of them are from this type one from the earlier zeer, which connects to the, the archeological use of the site. It's, it's more, more used in the early, earlier part of the middle kingdom, the late 11th through the mid you know, 12th dynasty. Um, and overall, the zero assemblage at site five and Wadi El Hudi as a whole is variable. There's a lot of different fabrics. There's different firing conditions. There's different shapes. There's different some differences in forming techniques in terms of how these pots are made. I mean, universally, the body is coil made and pulled, but the rims can be coil made or turned on a wheel. So there's a bit of a, a difference between some of those those approaches to to making the rim part that was attached to them to the rest of the body. So let's look here at these samples to kind of understand what is happening. Okay, so zero type one in Marl C fabric one, there's 15 in the sample, and this is a very homogenous sample. It's 8.7% of the coefficient of variation. And overall, most of the, the, the samples are 23 to 26, 23 to 26 centimeters in rim diameter. And there's one sample that goes from 26, 20, 27, 26, 27, 28 to 30. And then there's one that's here at 21 kind of sitting by, by itself. Um, but this one is still pretty, pretty homogenous. Now, when I removed this one, just to see 
what the impact would be, the coefficient of variation dropped down to like 3.2%. Um, but this is more what we expect when you're confidently in a, in a pottery type, size type for very homogeneous pottery. Then we get down here to uh, type two, fabric two. Now, this CV was 14.6%, a sample size of 27. And as we can see, it spreads from rim diameters of 19 all the way up to 37. And there's one instance for all these with big gaps in the middle and two instances that are 19 with a gap at 20 and then a gap here. But again, most of our, our clustering is again at this 25 centimeter, so 24 to 26. And then we have a bit of a 27 to 29. So what does one do? So if I removed the outlier of 19 and 36, so it was just 34 to, to 20, it dropped down to 6.42. So that's something that I'm considering, I don't know what to do with it here. Uh, and I need to reflect on and think a little bit more. And then this one, type two, the later type, had only nine in the sample and from Marl C fabric one, C Marl C two, this was, these are, you know, more similar to this coefficient of variation. And again, there, this has a one sort of outlier at 20. And then we have, a, again, both of them have a cluster at 24, 25, 26. This is where it's most common with the rim diameters. And then we have some here at the end as well. So it's, it's different than the beer jars and the votive dishes. The beer jars and the votive dishes at Abidos did not have these kind of you know, bigger gaps in, um, in, in, in rim diameter for, for the spread of, of, of rim diameter measurements. So this kind of got me thinking what to do next. So my observations, my preliminary observations is that generally this is fairly homogenous on par with Umaga beer jars, particularly for this type one. And these are more along the lines of the North Abidos beer jars, if I think about sample variability. But if the outliers are removed, it drops down to become very homogenous. But I see two trends here. Most of the zero rim diameters cluster between 24 and 26 centimeters. And then we have this incredibly widespread. So this has implications that I need to rethink in terms of zeros as rim sizes, zeros with rim sizes, because again, we don't have whole pots. So I can't understand size as much as well as I would like to if we had whole pots. So potentially there are different size classes of zeers and I need to, to reflect on that and consider that and research more, more uh, zeers from other archeological sites to see if they have the same kind of thing. Um, but this might also have implications for workshops, sources and organization of production. So there could be a situation where there is a zero type that is 24 to 26 centimeters in rim diameter that comes from a specific set of workshops. And then there's a bunch of other workshops that are supplying small quantities of, of, um, of zeers that have a much wider array of rim diameters. Now, the difficult thing is that there's no significant differences in the confidence intervals between the, the samples. So this makes me think that I need to look at this, look at the samples again and evaluate and reflect a little more. But it seems to point to more variability within this, this assemblage. Uh, so my next steps to kind of help me refine this and figure out what to do now and how to interpret this is I need to actually include the pots from the upper courtyard that I drew and measured. And that's because the pots from the upper courtyard, these years down here, they were from the upper courtyard and they were thrown down. So if I can, unify the samples from both of these as one big metric amount analysis sample, I think I can help refine these samples and get more clear answers. And I also need to examine the pots in the, the lab. And fortunately, we're going back in a couple months to see this 24 to 26 centimeter group to see if there are indeed differences and if this is a more homogeneous group and if the other smaller and larger ones are outliers and perhaps from different workshops or different production centers. So I need to look at differences in manufacturing technique and fabric um, and to see if this is potentially a viable interpretation for this metric analysis result. So as you can see, metric analysis results require interpreting in terms of all the information you have from the archeological context of the pots as a whole, 
and from um, pots from other archaeological sites to help give an understanding of this type. Um, so we need to draw on a lot of information in order to interpret. So my conclusions is that metric analysis is pretty complex, but that's what makes it so exciting and interesting. Um, there's a lot of reasons for metric variability within assemblage, and it's important to understand the potential sources of variability, the archaeological context, the pottery type at the site you're looking at, a, and more broadly at other sites. There needs to be a deep consideration of the samples, and you need to think statistically, use some kind of significance, you know, think in terms of samples, sample sizes, the relationship between the sample and the parent population, and use some kind of significance testing which would, or confidence intervals, which would be very helpful. And you need to interpret the results with caution. Uh, metric analysis is just really one line of evidence. And I wouldn't have been able to interpret the Abydos material if I didn't also take into account the archaeological evidence that we have from the few New Kingdom pottery production sites in general. If I didn't really look at beer jars uh, as, a, as, as a pottery type, and if I didn't look at beer jars specifically at Abydos from lots of other contexts, both at the North Abydos and at Umal Gab. So it's really important to remember that metric analysis, these numbers, it's, it's, it's very natural for people to look at a number and think that that's gonna give you some kind of magic answer, but it doesn't. These numbers give you parameters to think and understand and reflect and weigh lots of different types of, of evidence. So it's just an interpretive tool, not a finite answer in itself. So thank you so much for listening and thank you for all these people that, that supported this research with measuring pottery. Um, and please contact me if you want any more information about how to calculate the confidence intervals uh, using the statistical program R because I'm very happy to walk you through that.